<clears throat> I'm now honored to introduce you to our next speaker, Dr. Tom Sommerfeld. Dr. Sommerfeld is the Chief Research Officer at Feeding America, which leads, it in, at Feeding America, Dr. Sommerfeld leads the development and execution of Feeding America's strategic research agenda, which is a roadmap for developing a deeper understanding of hunger in America, identifying the transformative strategies that will solve hunger, and measuring and reporting the organization's progress along the way. His work has included diverse projects that share a common focus on improving outcomes for vulnerable populations <clears throat> and reducing social disparities. Tom has held faculty appointments at Vanderbilt, Tennessee State, Michigan State, and the University of Chicago. Dr. Sommerfeld's talk is Affordable Nutrition, Feeding America's Response to This National Crisis. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sommerfeld. Good morning. good morning. It's good to see you all. I'm going to do something a little different, which is to say thank you in the beginning. Usually speakers will go blah, 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 and they get to the end and say thank you for having me. I'm going to do it now. Um, and I'll try to interject some of this. I appreciate uh, Mike and the team giving me the next four hours to talk about everything that I want to talk about. In reality, I get 12 minutes. And it's going to be really hard for me because I get so deeply passionate about this. And, um, the theme of the conference, I'm a clinical psychologist, early training, um, and then took, took a right turn into research and have been doing uh, public health research, mental health research um, for many decades now. I think I have the gray hair to prove it. Um, but nutrition in particular is just such hard work, particularly when you're trying to work in the healthcare arena. Because adoption in healthcare is slow. There's literature that documents when we've got something that's evidence based, that's proven, it takes at least 12 years for that to get into medical practice. 12 years! Holy cow, right? You can have a toddler actually driving a car in that period of time, right? If you think about it. Um, nutrition is not covered in curricula, and I mean from grade school all the way through medical school. When I talk, I used to teach medical students and residents, and I'd ask them, Look, how much nutrition do you get? We had a part of a chapter, maybe a paragraph or two. And do they remember that? No, absolutely not. And it's not in any of their exams. So it's not a wonder that that's absent in the healthcare space. And in general, because of that lack of curriculum, that lack of leadership in the, in the medical space, People are just uninformed and unwilling. So two weeks ago, I got a call from my mom. She's got COPD. She's a lung cancer survivor, CHF. Um, she's a darling woman. And I, could, I, I have lots of stories. She's just a spitfire. She's like 4'11", and uh, about 4'11". She's kind of, my kids call her the square. Um, <laughs> And she's in the hospital. She got admitted to the hospital because she thought it would be a really great idea to treat herself to Chinese takeout with CHF. So guess what? She had a CHF complication. She's in the hospital for a week. The, the really frustrating part about that is she's 30 years a nurse. <laughs> 30 years a nurse. She knows better. So I really just want to thank you for all that you're doing. And I know you're in all different spaces, but this is important work. And Tambra couldn't have, I mean, I couldn't have said it any better than Tambra. We are in a nutritional security crisis. Um, so here's a couple of things you probably already know. Food is core to being a human being. If you think about it, every time we get together, it's like, who's bringing that dish? Who's got the food? Who's like, it is in our culture. It's part of being a human being is food. It brings us to the table. And I, I, did, I did tell you I was a psychologist, right? So I bring in a little, bring in a little psych, psychology here. So Maslow's hierarchy, food is at the basis. There's, it's foundational to being a human being, to actualizing one's greatest potential is very, very, very there at the bottom. Right? Food. Um, and I, you know, you've heard this thing called social determinants of health by now. Again, food is key in there. 
Finally, um, there is a difference between hunger and nutritious food security. Um, hunger is a physiological experience, whereas nu nutritious food insecurity is that lack of being able to know when the next meal is coming, or how am I going to make ends meet, or I'm trying to decide, do I pay my rent, or do I buy groceries for my family? Do I risk having the electric cut off, or do I buy groceries for my family? Um, and pff, with the current state of affairs, we've, we've gotten feedback from some of the folks that we serve. Women are now having to choose between personal items and food because you know those personal care items have gone up so much with the inflation and, and supply chain. So it's some of the things we take for granted. You have to ask, you know, really not take for granted. Okay, quiz time. Are you ready? Let's, here we go. Audience participation. As Tom said, what's the least nutritional meal that you can think of? So get in your head. All right. I, who wants to share? Just. Scotch, cereal, what else? <laughs> Twinkies, over here. Snickers. Frappuccinos. That's my wife. We go shopping. She's like, I'm like, I'm starving. Can we get something to eat? And she's like, no, I, I, I had a latte. That's going to hold me over for the next four hours. I'm like, honey, that is not, that doesn't work for me. One more. <laughs> Cheetos, right? I, I uh, just recently moved, but I lived on the south side of Chicago for 15 years. It was amazing to me how many school-aged children I'd see walking to school, flaming hot Cheetos in one hand, Mountain Dew in the other. I'm on my way to school. All right. There you go. Thank you. So those are all really great answers. The one thing that I would say is the least nutritious meal is an empty plate. It's the meal that's not there. Um, and a few things I'll, I'll tell you about Feeding America if you haven't heard of us or know of us. It's a network of 199 food banks with 60,000 community partners serving every community in the United States including D.C. and Puerto Rico. In 2021, we served at least 53 million people. So take a, take a moment and soak that. That's a lot of people. That's one in six people in the United States. And nearly six billion meals that we served. Six billion is a huge number. I don't, I can never, oh, well, I'd love to take credit for that, but it's thousands of volunteers, staff members, and uh, folks giving of their time, treasure, and talent. So I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, six billion meals, I, I tried to explain that to folks. It's huge. If you took all those meals, the dinner plates, and lined them up side by side, you'd go back and forth to the moon twice. Or if they were seconds on a clock, be 180 years. <laughs> so it's a lot of meals, a lot of meals. Um, and 40 years ago is when the network started, um, really around disaster relief, emergency disaster relief, and then quickly found food insecurity in every single community in the United States. In fact, we've got a tool uh, that, that the research team has developed called Map the Meal Gap. And uh, if you go to feedingamerica.org, uh, down in the bottom under research, map the meal gap. You can go to your county, you can go to your congressional district, you can go to your state and look at the figures. It's stunning, stunning. Even in wealthy areas like Silicon Valley and uh, other places here in San Diego, huge needs. Um, and no big surprise because of structural racism, discrimination, food insecurity, disproportionately impacts communities of color, as well as rural areas. Um, and so we have this kind of bifurcated mission. It really is, what do you need today to make those trade-offs easier for you? 
Because can you imagine skipping a meal so that your kid can eat, so that you can pay the electricity, so you can get your flat tire fixed to get to it? Like, those are just rid like ridiculously difficult decisions for people to make. So we work on that, the immediate need, but we also work on how do you end food insecurity in one of the richest nations in the world? So we do both of that. So I, I don't know, I just made this up. Affordable nutrition, people talk about affordable housing and so forth, but really when you think about it, right, it's one thing to think about the, you know, the gut biome and, and, and things like that, supplements and so forth, but when people can't put food on the table, the last thing they're thinking about is what is that latest and greatest supplement that I can get. So when I talk about affordable nutrition, it really is around awareness, access, and availability to healthy culturally preferred food. Now let me deal with the elephant in the room perhaps. Food banks sometimes have a, a reputation that, oh, they're just giving out as much calories, pounds of food, you know, let me give you 15 pounds of rice and a, and a bag of dry beans and off you go. Um, that is not uh, the focus, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, what's interesting is those, those disparities in food insecurity, nutritious food insecurity in particular, are great and no wonder they align perfectly over health disparities. So when you see great disparities in food insecurity, you see it in health, life expectancy, life expectancy as well. And then finally, food insecurity seldomly rides alone. It's got passengers with it all the time. Unemployment, lack of affordable housing, child care, health conditions that also lead to medical expenses which complicate and further deepen food insecurity. Um, the other thing that when you see um, food insecurity in the community, so I just talked about individual level, but in the community, you also see food insecurity with passengers. You see food deserts or south side of Chicago, food swamps, where if I want to go grocery shopping, I go to the corner market and pick up my Doritos, <laughs> you know, whatever's available, or um, maybe even worse yet, I'm going to the fast food chain because I can get a, you know, a sack of burgers for five bucks or what have you. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about um, um, examples of Feeding America's current solution set. Um, sourcing to share. So it used to be those 199 food banks uh, if I was in, you know, the Jersey port, there might be a, a ship with a bunch of produce on it. And the produce is going to be bad, they can't offload it, so they're going to donate it to the food bank. The food bank says, that's awesome, but I can't take a whole ship. Let me just get 10% of what you have, right? So it was very um, focused on the individual food bank in what I would call kind of an association. <clears throat> so each food bank was looking out for it itself. Well, we take the, the term network very seriously. So now they source for themselves, I'll take that 10%, but give me another 50% that I can share with all of the other food banks in the region. So it's a mindset change. Um, we've developed regional produce cooperatives uh, in the Midwest, the Southeast, the, the West, uh, and Texas, um, which has its own kind of region, um, to, to, help share, to help share that healthy food. Um, we've developed choice markets and pantries. So it's not, I, you know, during COVID you saw uh, the news, and they had this lines and lines of cars waiting uh, for food, um, which is both heartbreaking and, and good to see. But we've developed these so people have the, a shopping experience that's similar to everybody else. Uh, in that experience, we give healthy nudges, foods to encourage, and have folks follow uh, healthy eating guidelines. Um, uh, we've also interfaced heavily with the healthcare system to do produce prescriptions, medically tailored meals, pantries uh, in the hospitals, and clinics in the food banks. 
So all these different kind of creative ways it, it locally that folks can respond to uh, the nutritional security crisis. Um, but there's challenges. It's hard to scale. There's no aligned metrics between healthcare and what we're doing, what you all are doing, um, and the incentives per, for providers, for patients, and for the healthcare systems uh, um, are not there. So that always leads to opportunities. First of all, learning from lived experience, I myself, uh, as a child, we had food stamps, we were food insecure. Um, and at the White House conference, we had 40 people there with living experience, folks that were clients of, of, our, of our network that came to talk about that. And one of the most powerful things was a woman from Mississippi who said, I want to eat healthy, I know I have to eat healthy, and I know how to eat healthy, but I can't afford it because I have my grandchildren in, in, the, in the house and my bills are stacking up. I think one of the greatest opportunities, particularly for the ANA and for all of you, is nutrition education. It's lacking. My mom, 30-year-old nurse, needed that education. I actually demanded that they send the nutritionist to her room to scold her <laughs> and to educate her. Right? And she got home and she said, thank you, I got it now, I got the message. Um, and developing meaningful collaborations, not just kind of tips of the hat, but really, how do we dig in? How do we do this? How do we serve people in the best way possible, in the most dignified way possible, and how do we improve equitable access to nutritious foods? And then finally, I would offer this, this piece, time, talent, and treasure are ways that people can support those in, in most need. You know, we're not seeing demand going down at, at that, quote, end of the pandemic. We've actually seen it just stay. So I'm, I'm probably at the end of this year, when we calculate the number of people served in 2022, it's gonna be really close to 53 million people. And I'll leave you with this last piece, final piece, the, uh, the response in 2020, feds came, stepped, stepped up, private stepped up, and you know, nonprofits stepped up. Food insecurity could have been off the charts, ridiculous. It had been going down for years and years. One would expect it to, to rifle up. It actually stayed the same in 2020 as it did in 2019, and that was all due to the response. So we can actually move the needle on this and hunger and uh, nutritional insecurity, uh, but it has to take a concerted effort. Thank you for your time, I appreciate you all.